For this talk, we describe the big picture for finite groups. Here, we'll give no proofs, we just point the way to the classification of finite simple groups. Now, G is a finite group. We now have the tools to answer the question of classification in special cases. For instance, if G is a group of low order, so for us that means G has less than or equal to 11 elements, then we can classify all groups this type up to isomorphism. Using our tools, we could do many other cases with low order. We also have fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups, which lets us classify all finite abelian groups up to isomorphism. Now, the tools that we use here, we have conjugacy classes in the class equation, we have CELO theory, and we have direct or semi-direct products. Now, for direct or semi-direct products, we're looking for a normal subgroup that lets us break our group into two smaller subgroups. For all the cases we've seen, these smaller subgroups have always been abelian. If we insist on that, we're gonna run into problems. First, we have A5, the alternating group on five letters. This group is finite, simple, and non-abelian. So we're never gonna find that normal subgroup that lets us break this group into smaller pieces. Even if we have normal subgroups, we'll still run into problems insisting on a semi-direct product. So consider the example of the quaternion group. Okay, this has eight elements. If we take the intersection of any two non-trivial subgroups, we always get plus or minus one. So we'll never be able to write the quaternion group as a semi-direct product. Now here, all is not lost. We can still break this group down into smaller pieces. We're just gonna have an answer for a different question. Now, let's see how we break this thing down and then we'll set up some machinery. So what I wanna do, okay, we have the quaternion group. And what I wanna find is a normal subgroup that's as large as possible without being the entire group. So if I take H1 equal to plus minus one plus minus I, I could form the quotient group. That'll have two elements. So this quotient group is isomorphic to Z mod two. Z mod two is a simple group. I repeat this procedure with H1. So I'm gonna look for largest normal subgroup in here. Okay, so I can use plus minus one. I form the quotient group. Again, we get a Z mod two. And we note that H2 itself is a Z mod two. So the end result of this procedure is gonna be three simple groups, all isomorphic to Z mod two. Here's our procedure in general. We start with a finite G. First, we ask if G is simple. If so, we stop. Otherwise, there's gonna exist a maximal normal subgroup, okay, N, okay, and that's not gonna be equal to E or G itself. Okay, maximal is just gonna mean there's no normal subgroups between N and G. The condition of maximal, that means that G mod N is a simple group. Then, we're gonna repeat our procedure by putting N in to step one. Now, if we take any group of order eight, what'll come out are gonna be three Z mod twos, like we've seen in the quaternion example. Okay, where the Z mod twos are just gonna be our G mod Ns. Now, the way we should think of what we're doing here, okay, well, we're reducing our group to a list of simple groups. So I think of the simple groups as the bricks. What makes, say, the quaternion group different from D8, different from Z2 cross Z2 cross Z2, is how these simple groups are all glued together. So what we're doing here is just stripping out all the glue and looking at the bricks. Now, definition, okay, we'll call a subnormal series for G. This is gonna be a chain of subgroups, starting with the identity, ending at G. Each subgroup 
is going to be normal in the successive subgroup. So I don't have to have this H sub i normal in G or H1 or H2. I just want H sub i normal in H sub i minus 1. If we can arrange that successive quotients are simple, then we'll call this a composition series. We can always arrange a composition series using our procedure here. So what this is going to do for each group, I'm able to associate to it this collection of quotient groups, which we'll call the simple factors for our group. Result, we have the Jordan-Holder theorem, which says simple factors do not depend on the choices of normal subgroups that we make okay, in the composition series. For an example, consider D12, symmetry group of a regular hexagon. We could set up composition series as follows. So note we're using very different subgroups here. But Jordan Holder says the simple factors that come out will be the same. When we check, we get two Z2s and a Z3 in each case. So Jordan Holder works here. Now one thing you'll notice, and it's not an accident, in all the examples we've considered so far, these simple factors are always abelian. So there's Z mod P where P is a prime. Definition, if each simple factor is abelian, then we'll say that G is solvable. Now, there are gonna be other definitions of solvable. The one we give here is just the most convenient for our setup. So the question is, what does it take for our group to not be solvable? Well, if we consider groups with order less than 200, there's only going to be two classes for non-abelian simple groups. At 60, we'll have the class for A5, and at 168, we'll have the class for SL3Z2, and that's going to be a matrix group. Now, what this means, okay, for instance, if we consider groups whose order is less than 120, only way we're not solvable is if we're looking at A5. So, for something that's not solvable, okay, we can consider each of these, but more important, consider S5, symmetric group on five letters. So the composition series that I have here, I have the identity, normal in A5, normal in S5, with factors A5 and Z mod two. Now, this becomes more important in abstract algebra when we get to Galois theory. So what's going to come out of here is that because S5 is not solvable, there will be no quintic formula. Now what I mean by that, if I have okay, a quadratic, say x squared plus bx plus c equal to zero, if I want to solve that, we use the quadratic equation. For cubics and quartics, we have equations that give us the roots. They're more complicated, but they exist. And when I get to a quintic, this business of not being solvable is going to prevent us from having a general formula for getting the roots of a quintic. We can get the roots of a quintic in special cases, but there's no general procedure. To better understand composition series, we focus on the simple factors. That means we want to know about finite simple groups. To start, we're in the abelian case, then our group is isomorphic to Z mod P, where P is a prime. If we consider groups of order P to a power, okay, where P is a prime, then the class equation says that the center is non-trivial. We can use that to show that our group is solvable. So that means if we have a group whose order is a power of a prime, it's only simple if it's of the form Z mod P. Now, to get beyond these cases, we need techniques beyond what we have in the course, so I'll just state results without proof. Next, we have Burnside's theorem. So if instead of taking one power of a prime, we take a product of two powers of primes, that's the order of our group, then Burnside says automatically solvable. Now, Burnside's theorem is within the undergraduate curriculum, 
If you've had group theory and advanced linear algebra, you can learn representation theory, and then Burnside's is just an application. Well beyond the undergraduate curriculum is the fight thompson theorem, or thompson fight This is simple to state, but it's a difficult piece of work. So this says, if the order of our group is odd, then we have automatically that our group is solvable. So simple to state. Now, for the proof, this takes up an entire issue of the Pacific Journal of Mathematics, coming in at over 250 pages. So note, what does this say? Well, this says, if I have a simple group that's not abelian, then its order has to be even. Okay, let's put these together and look at some small numbers. So, if I want a finite simple group that's not abelian, Burnside says we need at least three prime factors. Fight Thompson says we need even order. So the smallest candidate that we could have for a finite simple group that's not abelian is 30, but CELO theory will rule that out. So if we go up one more, okay, multiply by two, we get 60, and there we find A5. Okay, so note three prime factors and even. For 168, we have three prime factors and even also. Now, well beyond all this, okay, the big program is the classification of finite simple groups. So the major work on this culminated in the late 70s, early to mid 80s, with closing of a gap in the proof in the early 2000s. So, end result here, there are gonna be 18 families Okay, so these are each countable. And we've seen one of them. So we saw A sub n, the alternating groups. Then the other families are gonna be of Lie type, which just means they're associated to matrix groups. Now, outside of these 18 families, there are gonna be 26 sporadic groups, 27 depending on how you count. So these don't fall in the pattern that we have here. Now, can't talk about the classification without bringing up the monster group. This is the largest sporadic group. Its order, here's factorization into prime powers. That's roughly eight times 10 to the 53rd power. So that's not a number that we use every day. It's not a league of grams number, but it's still a number that's gonna make difficult computer calculations. Now, philosophy behind symmetry groups. If we have large irregular objects, we expect few symmetries. So for the monster group, okay, it's very large and it doesn't fall into one of our families. So we expect it to tell an interesting story. And it does, involving number theory and string theory. Before we get to that, let's talk about things that we can understand in terms of our course. First, the monster group has 194 conjugacy classes. So this isn't bad compared to the size of the group. Now, if we had some representation theory, this would say that there are 194 irreducible representations over the complex numbers. Now, what's a representation? Well, formally, it's gonna be a homomorphism from our group into the group of invertible n by n matrices over the complex numbers. So representation just means we want to represent our group as a group of matrices. Now, another way to say that, we have a group action on a vector space by linear transformations. Now, it's of interest to get this n as small as possible. So for the monster group, the smallest n is gonna be 196,883, which is just the product of the three largest prime factors of the order. Now, so that says the best way we could represent the monster if we use matrices is if those matrices are, okay, this n by n. For the interesting story, this goes by the name of monstrous moonshine. Why moonshine? In England, moonshine is slang for either a crazy idea or something that's shadowy or illusory. 
Of course, in the States, moonshine is hard illegal alcohol. So both of these are supposed to suggest that there's some really far reaching guesses going on, but with no substantiation yet. Now, what happened as the theory of the monster group developed? They noticed some of the numbers coming out of it were important for number theory. For instance, in number theory, we have these gadgets called modular functions, and in particular, the J function. So if we expand the J function as a Laurent series in Q, when we go past the constant term, the coefficients are going to be related to the dimensions of the irreducible representations of the monster. So for instance, from the previous board, we saw 196,883. So this is just this number plus one. And as we go further out, these dimensions are gonna keep recurring as sums. Another connection in number theory, okay, for each prime, we have a mechanism that assigns each prime to a group. Then we can take that group and get a Riemann surface, which is gonna be a gadget from complex analysis. It turns out that the prime factors of the monster group are to be precisely those primes that yield Riemann surfaces of genus zero. So that was another interesting connection without an explanation. Now, for this first part, okay, this goes by the name of the moonshine conjecture, okay, as given by Conway and Norton. Okay, now Conway might recognize this is the Conway of both Conway's soldiers and Conway's game of life. So what the moonshine conjecture does, okay, it just explains coefficients of the J function in terms of the representation theory of the monster. And there's a precise statement for that. Now, this is proved by Borchards in 1992. For his work, he got the Fields Medal in 98. So Borchards' work is where string theory comes into the picture.